Today is about the rest of your life. It's about tomorrow and the day after that. The future God has planned for you shouldn't be a haphazard approach to life. You might feel stuck, but you don't have to be. Perhaps you're discouraged. It's time to deal with that. And if you feel uncertain, you can find clarity. You may not know what's next, but God does. He's there waiting for you in your tomorrow. So step into it and discover God's presence and purpose in your life, starting today, starting now. But you can be sure of this. If you pray and you're sincere in your heart and you're walking with God, He hears your prayer and He will answer it. That's coming up on today's special forward edition of Turning Point. In just a moment, Dr. Jeremiah will guide you into an active prayer life where you'll discover that prayer is the divine energy that brings the power of God into the plans he gives us. Young Lenora Wood volunteered to go to the Appalachian Mountains to teach in a one-room mission school. There in the impoverished town of Del Rio, Tennessee, she became something of a living legend thanks to her commitment to prayer. Leonora knew how to turn dreams into prayer and prayer into dreams. Raymond Thomas was a foster teen who often stopped at Leonora's cabin in his knee-high clodhoppers and talked with her as she sat on the front porch shelling peas or darning socks. Raymond's seemingly impossible dream was to go to college. But how can I manage it? He said, I haven't got any money. I don't have any prospects. I've not saved anything. Raymond, Leonora replied, whatever you need, God has the supply ready for you. The money will be there for any dream that's right for you, every dream for which you're willing to work. Raymond asked Leonora to offer a dreaming prayer for him, and her prayer went like this. Father, you've given Raymond a fine mind. We believe that you want Raymond's potential to be used to help you lift and lighten some portion of your world. Since all the wealth of the world is yours, please help Raymond find everything he needs for an education. Raymond Thomas did make it through college in four years, working 12 jobs to support himself and graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree, cum laude. He also served in World War II and later settled in Vienna, where he earned a PhD in physics. He went on to visit 60 countries, master multiple languages, and network with some of the most important people in Europe through his job with the U.S. Atomic Energy Program. Looking back on his life, Raymond said, the fact that I could dream of going to college and achieve it proves something to me. Very simply, any right dream can be realized, and prayer helps you know if it's right and gives you the power to stay with it. In other words, Listen carefully. The way forward is to pray forward. I think that's what Nehemiah would say too. He was one of the most effective leaders in the Bible, and his story unfolds in the Old Testament book that bears his name. Executives and entrepreneurs study his book endlessly because of the leadership lessons that are found in it. Nehemiah was a Jewish official serving the Persian king in the city of Susa, a thousand miles from Jerusalem. The Babylonians had destroyed Israel and Jerusalem in 586 BC, and several thousand Hebrew settlers had gone back to rebuild the temple and reestablish a Jewish presence there. This was a deep burden for Nehemiah. He knew God's plan of redemption depended on the continuity of his people in their land. He understood that it was a matter of heartfelt prayer to make this happen. One day, Nehemiah's brother and a few other men arrived from Jerusalem with this grim message. The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. This news hit Nehemiah like a blast. Slumping into his chair, he started sobbing. But out of his deep tears came earnest prayers, and out of his prayers came a fervent dream. With God's help, Nehemiah would return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of the ancient city of his God. 
It seemed an impossible feat because Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer and a trusted advisor. The likelihood of King Artaxerxes releasing him, let alone financing the trip, seemed very far-fetched. But God, he'd already planted the dream in Nehemiah's heart, just as he is planting fresh dreams in your heart today. So you have to prepare your heart for God's plan. God's desires flourish in prepared hearts, just like seeds in a furrowed ground. In the last message, I urged you to imagine your future. If you're saying, yeah, I want to do that, but you're not certain what your dream is or what the next step forward is, then prayer is where you should start. Nehemiah saw a need that burdened his heart, and he started to pray about it. I've studied the book of Nehemiah many times, and there are two verses that tell us something about dreams, not the kind you have at night, but the kind that guide you forward. Notice these two telling phrases. Nehemiah claimed that God put it in my heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Later he said, my God put it in my heart to organize the people. Nehemiah didn't come up with his dream for Jerusalem's wall by himself. His heart was receptive to the impressions God sent him. Let me tell you what I've learned. A prayerful heart is fertile ground for divine ideas. How can you be sure the dream in your heart is God's will and not yours? Well, you must humbly and specifically ask God to place his ideas for your life into your heart and mind. You do that through prayer. You pray and you ask the Lord to help you be sensitive to what he's telling you to do. And then you pray about the plans that he gives you day and night. No matter the hour of circumstances, pray. As God begins to give you impressions and thoughts about your future, continue to pray. Commit them to him in serious, ongoing prayer. And as soon as Nehemiah sensed the need for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, listen. He sat down and he wept and he mourned for many days and he was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. As his thoughts clarified and he better understood what needed to happen, he wrote out an earnest prayer. It's preserved for us in the book that bears his name. Here it is. I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night. Nehemiah went on to confess his sins and those of his people. He reminded God of the biblical promises involving the children of Israel. And he ended by saying, O Lord, I pray, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who was this man? Oh, it was King Artaxerxes, the most powerful man on the earth. And even though Nehemiah was his cupbearer, he couldn't approach the king without risking his life. Only God could arrange the right moment. So Nehemiah prayed. E.M. Bounds was a 19th century pastor who wrote a powerful book on the subject of prayer. I've read many of his books. Every page is kind of convicting, so I can only read them in small doses. But Ian Bounds called prayer spiritual energy. Here's what he wrote. He said, What great things are accomplished by this divinely appointed means of grace? It brings things to pass which would never otherwise occur. Bounds said that the story of prayer is the story of great achievements. Prayer is a wonderful power placed by Almighty God in the hands of his people, which may be used to accomplish great purposes and achieve unusual results. The Bible says it this way, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Prayer is the divine energy that brings the power of God into the plans that he's giving you. I don't know any shortcut for this. God guides his children as they learn the joy of praying to him night and day. So prepare your heart for God's plan and pray about your plans day and night and then learn to practice spontaneous prayer. It's 
It's wonderful to have a leisurely hour on the patio for Bible study and prayer or to engage in a special extended time in prayer with friends at church asking God for his favors. But sometimes you have to pray instantly. Sometimes you have to pray urgently on the spur of the moment. And it's good to know that the Lord hears those prayers as well. I urge you to learn to pray quickly, silently, and instantly. No one in the Bible mastered that skill better than Nehemiah. His book is peppered with short little prayers that were injected into his narrative. He knew how to pray spontaneously. For example, one day the king wanted a glass of wine. So Nehemiah prepared it. And here is Nehemiah 2, 1 and 2. I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in the presence of the king before. And so the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Now, a little interpretation here. Nehemiah knew these words could have reflected genuine concern, or they could have been his death sentence. Believe it or not, in that day, it was a capital offense to be sad in the presence of the king. So watch carefully what Nehemiah did. He senses the urgency of the moment. Verses 2 through 5. So I became dreadfully afraid, and I said to the king, Good move. May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And then the king said to me, what do you request? Now watch this. So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my fathers, that I may rebuild it. I'm sure you noticed it. Here's the phrase. I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. In the twinkling of an eye, Nehemiah had his opportunity, but he had to say exactly the right thing in the right way to move the king to his cause. His life was on the line, not to mention the desires of his heart. It was critical for him to speak wisely and for the king to react positively. So Nehemiah shot up an arrow to heaven. Maybe it was just help, Lord, help. Most of us know that prayer. We've prayed it on occasion. The Lord answered, and soon Nehemiah was on his way to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. When you know how to earnestly pray day and night, then you will find out there's great power in spontaneous prayer as well. One fateful day back in 2001, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hooten was working on the first floor in the C ring of the Pentagon. That's sort of in the middle of the building. He was preparing for a 10 o'clock meeting when a co-worker came into his office with news that the World Trade Center was on fire in New York. Hooten went to his boss's office where the television was on. He watched events unfold, then had a feeling down deep that he should get up and return to his own office. Along the way, he stopped to talk to someone in a nearby cubicle, and suddenly the whole room burst into flames, and Hooten was thrown 20 feet forward. His left leg was pinned to the floor beneath rubble, and the walls were on fire. He yelled for his co-worker, but heard no response. He recalls, at that moment, I said a short prayer, asking God to show me the way out. He pried his leg loose and saw some light in the distance, and crawling through an opening, he found he was trapped again, and the room was full of smoke, and so were his lungs. He said the room was like an oven, and at that moment I thought I was going to die of smoke inhalation. He climbed over more rubble, saw a hand reaching out to him, and at once he was on the helicopter pad outside the Pentagon. He began helping others, not realizing he was bleeding from multiple shrapnel wounds. When he shares his story now, he credits his survival to God answering simple words, God, show me a way out. Did you know that God answers prayers like that? When you're in the midst of following your dream and God has given you a plan and you're on your way to the goal, sometimes there are problems. There's no such thing as life without any challenges. There's the old statement that says, if there's no friction, there's no traction. Every major dream I have ever had, everything God has ever done in my life has been fraught with trouble. And often in the midst of it, you have to pray, Lord, help me. Help me to know what to do. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. So prepare your heart for God's plan through prayer. 
Pray about your plans day and night. Practice spontaneous momentary prayer. And here's number four. Prepare for God to do things his way. As God drops his seeds of aspiration into your mind and you pray over them, whether in quiet, extended prayer, or quick in the moment prayer, you're going to have to learn to trust him for his own brand of success. You'll have to expect him to do things his way. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. The word commit means to trust. God can be trusted with your dreams, to divulge them, develop them, sometimes delay them, and always drench them with his blessings. So you have to understand God opens doors and he closes doors. He arranges circumstances, and sometimes he creates trajectories you didn't even expect. In Nehemiah's case, the king granted him letters of safe conduct through the empire, along with provisions for the walls and the gates. Nehemiah said, and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And Artaxerxes sent a military convoy to accompany Nehemiah to Jerusalem because the Jews had a lot of enemies in Judah. When Nehemiah got into Jerusalem, Nehemiah wanted to keep his dream a secret until it was time to rally the Jews. So he saddled his horse in the darkness and inspected the ruins of the city by moonlight. And the next day he gathered the people and he said, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. Nehemiah declared with confidence, the God of heaven will help us. I believe with all of my heart that the God of heaven will grant success to his children who seek for his will in their lives. Remember, success doesn't mean health, wealth, fame, or fortune. When God uses the term success, it means the fulfillment of his plan for your life. And you have to trust him however that unfolds if you want to move forward. So prepare your heart for God's plan. Pray about your plans day and night. Practice spontaneous prayer and prepare for God to do things his way. And then I want to add this. Plead for overcoming strength in overwhelming moments. Have you had any overwhelming moments lately? If you're praying your way through what God wants you to do, that doesn't mean you won't have any trouble. That doesn't mean you won't have any problems. The devil will hurl his forces against God's unfolding work in your life. But let me tell you something, friends. Don't be bullied. Don't be intimidated. Never let yourself be discouraged. The devil will try to push you off the road. But the one to whom you pray is the one before whom the devils tremble. God will give you overcoming strength for overwhelming moments. That's what he did for Nehemiah. And get this. He and the residents of Jerusalem finished the wall in 52 days. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Only God could have done that. Believe me, you can't go forward in life without drenching every step in prayer. One of the greatest ships of all time was the RMS Mauritania, built in 1906. It had a distinguished career, captured the world record for crossing the Atlantic, served the British Navy during World War I, and even today, many of the furnishings of the Mauritania are woven into the interiors of some of the world's most exclusive buildings. Hidden away in history is this interesting fact. The Mauritania was built by prayer. The naval architect who constructed it would not put in a single piece of that great ship without definitely asking God to help him. And he would not receive any part of the machinery without having the consciousness that it had to be received from divine acceptance. Thus, the greatest ship in the world has been built by making prayer a working principle of life. So let me ask you to do that. Make a working principle in your life your prayer. Ask God for overcoming strength and overwhelming moments. Go forward in his power. Remember, it's not your dream God wants, it's you. And then could I just add this final kind of postscript to all of this? Praise God for what he does. You have one more opportunity to make prayer 
a part of your future. You have the privilege of praising God for his work in your life. Nehemiah and the Jews and Jerusalem finished the walls so quickly, they had time on their hands. So what's next? Well, let's have a Bible conference. With the security of a walled city, the Jewish settlers felt safe going about their lives. And furthermore, one section of the wall near the water gate formed like a new public square. So the word went out, all the people are come to the water gate. And Ezra the priest stood on a platform built for the occasion. And he praised the God of heaven. And the crowd lifted their hands upward and shouted, Amen, Amen. And when the wall was dedicated, great choirs marched along the parapets leading in worship. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. There's not anything in the world like the joy of watching God form and fulfill his plans for your life. And it only happens as we step toward our dreams in his presence through prayer. I begin this message by telling you about the inimitable Leonora Wood. Let me end with a special prayer composed by her daughter, Catherine Marshall. This prayer was inspired by her mother and was included in Marshall's book, Adventures in Prayer. Both Catherine and Leonora are in heaven now, but I'm sure they'll be thrilled if you make their prayer your prayer. Here it is. Father, once, it seems so long ago now, I had such big dreams, so much anticipation of the future. Now no shimmering horizon beckons me. My days are lackluster. Where is your plan for my life, Father? You have told us that without vision we perish. So Father in heaven, knowing that I can ask in confidence, what is your expressed will to give me? I ask you to deposit in my mind and heart the particular dream, the special vision you have for my life. And along with the dream, will you give me whatever graces and patience and stamina it takes to see the dream through to fruition? I sense that this may involve adventures I have not bargained for, but I want to trust you, God. I want to trust you enough to follow, even if you lead along new paths. So and empowers you to conquer your greatest obstacles. We're called to be overcomers, men and women. We're called to walk in victory and strength and peace and love. Sometimes I hear people say when I ask them how they're doing, I'm doing okay down under the circumstances. But we don't belong under the circumstances. We belong above the circumstances. We're not undercomers, we're overcomers. That was the basis for this series of messages, which is Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible tells us that we're to stand having girded our waist with the truth. It seems strange that the belt of the armor, which is in Ephesians 6, is the first item that Paul mentions. He says, wrap yourself around with the belt of truth. It wasn't a piece of armor. I mean, a, a belt's not going to keep you from being wounded. But the belt had a central function that was vital to the soldier's armor. The soldier had all of this equipment that he wore, and he had a shirt that draped from his shoulders to his knees. And the Roman soldier wore a metal torso armor that was long and protective with leather strips that hung from his waist to his lower thighs around his whole body. Very cumbersome. But his belt was a band of wide, thick leather with loops and slots that clamped over these items. And from this belt, there was a sword that hung and a rope and a ration sack and money and darts. Everything the soldier needed in hand-to-hand -hand combat was on his belt right there at his fingertips. But when the soldier had to run, he would pull his tunic up, which was down around his legs, and he would pull it up and he would tuck it in that belt and free his legs for speed and maneuverability. And when you read about it in the Bible, here's what it's called, girding one's loins. That's what that means. It means to pull your clothes up and tuck them in your belt so you can move rapidly. Now the belt didn't have any offensive function of its own. It was a piece of equipment that essentially held everything else together, keeping the soldier ready for anything that he might face. And here's what that means for us today in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, truth holds everything together. Truth makes us ready 
At the center of our lives, we place the truth in Jesus, and everything we do is drawn from that all-encompassing center. Listen to me. If we don't have the truth, we don't have anything. Without the truth, we are empty. We have nothing to offer the world. We have nothing to give anyone if we do not have the truth. But when we know the truth and we live the truth, we can assess our weapons quickly and confidently, and we don't have to fear anything being out of place in our lives. How many of you know how much better and simpler it is to just live in the truth? Have you ever caught yourself living in something that's not true, and you're always looking over your shoulder to see if somebody knows what the truth is? And when you don't tell the truth, you have to tell another lie to cover up the lie you told, and it just weaves itself around you until it just debilitates you. I just love it. Truth is simple. You know, just tell the truth and always tell the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says this. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Truth gives us the courage to stand against our enemy. Why is truth to be our primary concern? Because the weapons of Satan are the exact opposite. Do you know what Satan's weapons are? Here they are. They're falsehood and deception. Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to take your influence away in this world. And what he works against is the truth of God in your life. John 8, says of Satan, when he speaks a lie, listen to this, he speaks from his own resources, For Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Lies come from the enemy. If you've caught yourself in this little innocent lie, let me tell you, it didn't come from God. It came from Satan. Satan is the author of all falsehood. Falsehood does not come from God. And when we stand in the truth, we never speak from ourselves. We speak from the truth revealed to us through the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Speaking truth is not always comfortable. How many of you know it's always right? Almost 2,000 years ago, a Roman governor asked a profound and familiar question of a man who was about to be executed. He said to him, what is truth? We have no way of knowing whether Pilate's question was a serious question or just sarcastic. But we do know that minutes later, he turned Jesus over to an angry crowd to be crucified. Isn't it interesting? Pilate judged the truth. He sentenced the truth. He scourged the truth. He mocked the truth. He crucified the truth. When he asked Jesus, what is truth? Truth was standing right in front of him. Jesus Christ was the truth. The irony is at the very moment he asked this question, he was staring at the pure incarnation of truth. The one who is the truth had just said to him, Everyone who hears me, he is of the truth. And you know what? Ever since Pilate asked that question, what is truth? Everybody's been asking that question, haven't they? What is truth? And today, truth is up for grabs. According to Os Guinness, truth in any objective or absolute sense, truth that is independent of the mind of the knower, no longer exists. A simple way to illustrate what's happened to truth lies in the story I read about three baseball umpires who were debating their different style of umpiring. One of them said, there's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way they are. No, said the second umpire, that's arrogant. There's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way I see them. That's no better, said the third umpire. Why beat around the bush? Why not be realistic about what we do? There's balls and there's strikes and they ain't nothing till we call them. (laughs) Now watch this. The first umpire represents the traditional view of truth. Objective, independent of the mind and of the knower, there to be discovered as it is. What did he say? We call balls and strikes as they are. The second speaks for moderate relativism, truth as each person sees it. Here people say, well, I don't see that as true. You see it as true, but I see that as false. So everybody has their own truth. Can I get a witness? And the third umpire bluntly expresses the radical relativist, the postmodern position. Truth is not to be discovered. It's for each of us to create for ourselves. According to the relativist position, 
all of us, we, we just get to create our own truth. There is no such thing as objective truth. What's true for you is not true for me. I get to have my truth and you get to have your truth. As if there is no real truth. In the final analysis, truth corresponds to the first umpire's position. To what actually is. And that's why truth is found in God. God is the great I am. He is the truth. Do you know when the Bible says, in the beginning, God, that's the answer to everything. Because God is the ultimate reality. So what is true? It's God is true. In the beginning, God was. He is the self-existent one. He's the creator of everything that exists. God is truth, and all truth is God's truth. In the Bible, he is called the God of truth. The Father, the first person of the Trinity, is truth. Psalm 31, 5 says... Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. And you know Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. How should we be surprised to discover that Jesus Christ is truth as well? The Bible says Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. And because he is full of grace and truth, he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is the communicator of truth. He's the witness to the truth. He's the origin of the truth. He's the preacher of the truth. He is truth embodied. Truth is not some system or philosophy. Truth is a person. If you want to know the truth of God, you must come to know Jesus Christ because he alone is truth. That's why the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Why? You can't get to the Father unless you come through truth. And not only is God the Father truth and God the Son truth, don't be surprised, God the Holy Spirit is truth as well. We read, when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The next time somebody talks to you about their truth, well, this is my truth. Don't get caught up in that discussion. There's only one truth, and it's the truth of God. When we get connected with God, we're in his truth. But if we're anything else, we're in error and falsehood. There is not many divisions or, or versions of truth. There's only one truth. And God himself is that truth. So if that's the case, and we want to overcome falsehood with truth, how do we do that? I want to give you some thoughts about how we go about overcoming falsehood with truth. First of all, we overcome falsehood with truth by seeking the truth ourselves. To do battle with the enemy, the believer needs to know the truth about God, the truth about Christ, and the truth that is in this book we call the Bible. There's two things we can take out of this that we just do. First of all, we need to study the truth. You know what, folks? I've grown up in a culture of ministers who minimize the truth of the Word of God. If you can get five or six sentences that come from the Bible in some of their messages, you've had a lucky day. <laughs> People don't take their Bibles to church because they say, oh, you don't need all that Bible stuff. Well, if you don't need all that Bible stuff, why are you a pastor? Why are you a minister? If you don't need the Bible, what purpose do you have? You see, the truth is so critical because we have nothing else. Our whole life is based upon the truth of God. And it's a shame to me that so many believers don't understand that. Uh, if you come to Shadow Mountain Community Church, you're going to hear a message from the Bible. Uh, I don't, I'm not a motivator. Uh, I hope I'm motivational in what I say from the Bible, but I'm not a motivator. It's not what I do. I'm not a a public relations artist. I'm a preacher of the Word of God. So, so listen, listen, you guys. We need not to be ashamed that we study the truth. There's no premium on ignorance in the Christian life. You can't go around and brag about how much you don't know about the Bible. So in order to overcome falsehood with truth, you have to study the truth. And the truth is written in the scripture. It's systemized truth. I urge you to answer for yourself this question that a friend of mine by the name of Stu Weber asks. Are you involved in a regular, rigorous regimen of Bible study? If not, what in the world are you doing? 
Your mind, your most critical weapon in battle, is braced by doctrine. Your soul is strengthened by biblical knowledge. If God's people will make the knowledge of God and his word the pursuit of their lives, Satan gets discouraged and defeated when he comes to divide and deceive and destroy. To seek the truth, you must diligently search the scriptures. That's why we put Bible teaching on the radio, Bible teaching on television, and on the internet, and in books. Because the truth of God is what protects us. It's what gives us hope for the future. With all this stuff floating around, and fake news, and all the other stuff that's happening. I know the truth. The truth is my blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So you study the truth, and not only do you study it, you have to submit to the truth. Counterfeit truth is never more on display than in the way we often hear people speak of God in today's world. Listen to this. You've heard it before. My God wants me to be rich. The God I believe in, he'd never send anybody to hell. How dare your God claim to be the only one in heaven? When somebody says to me, my God would never do that, I tell them, you're absolutely right, because your God doesn't exist. You know, your God doesn't exist. You know why? You don't get to make your God to be who you want him to be. If you want to live immoral lives, you can't just say, well, my God's okay with that. No, he's not, because you don't have a God. Your, your God is somebody in your, in your imagination. God is who he is. We don't get to change him. His purpose is to change us. We don't get to change him. We live in this crazy time. And unfortunately in this time, there's this form of lying that is used by some people to justify not telling the truth. It's called spin. Spin is the recasting, reinterpretation, revision of the truth to make it more palatable. The point is not to be truthful. It's to reinterpret facts, to take the edge off of the truth and make it more politically correct and less offensive for your own goals. But in God's sight, spin is lying. You don't get to say, okay, well, it was 90% of the truth, so it's the truth. It's either 100% true or it's a lie. You know? Here's what the Bible says about God in Proverbs 6. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, listen to this. A proud heart, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil. Here's another. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. Let me just say it out loud. The Bible says God hates lying. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Our words, men and women, as Christians that are spoken or written, cannot be taken back. Once you tell a lie, it's out there. It has its own life, and even if the effects can be stopped or reversed, the reputation of the liar is forever damaged. Instead of lying, the overcomer has to learn how to speak the truth. How do we overcome falsehood with, with truth? We start with ourselves. We start speaking the truth. We stop coloring the truth. We stop making up things that make us look better when it's not the way it is. We just tell the truth. It's such a freeing thing to be people of truth. And God has called us to speak the truth. That's the first thing. Number two. We not only have to speak the truth, but the Bible says we have to speak it lovingly. You know, have you ever, told, have you ever been around people that say, well, I just, I just tell people the way it is. <laughs> then they vitiate you for three hours and it takes you a couple weeks to get over it. The Bible does say we're to speak the truth boldly, but we're also to speak it with love. The Bible says we're to speak the truth with grace. I heard about a fourth grade teacher who was recovering from surgery and got a get well card from her class. It read, Dear Mrs. Fisher, your fourth grade class wishes you a speedy recovery by a vote of 15 to 14. <laughs> I don't know if that story is true or not, but that's not truth and love, is it? 
Jesus said, by this, everybody will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. We need to speak the truth, absolutely, but we need to speak it with love, don't we? Jesus modeled that for us. Jesus was full of grace and truth. So that's how we should be as well. So we overcome falsehood by seeking the truth and by speaking the truth. And thirdly, we overcome falsehood by living the truth. Yes. The overcomer has to be clothed with truthfulness, integrated into his or her own life. Listen to the words of the Apostle John. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. God wants us to walk in. He doesn't want us just to study the truth. He doesn't want us just to speak the truth. He wants us to live in truth. Be true to ourselves. Be true to God. You know, every once in a while you read stories of people who live double lives. You know, somebody got two wives and they're scattered all over the country. They live in two lives. How in the world could you ever allow that to happen in your life? And how could you ever survive it? Truth is the integrating center of who we are in God. And we're to live the truth. You know, the Lord illustrated that for us in such a perfect way. Listen to this. When his enemies came to arrest him, he said to them, which of you convicts me of sin? Nobody said a word. Do you know why? <laughs> because they didn't have anything they could say. They had nothing legitimate to convict him of because he was absolutely everything he claimed to be. Jesus went to the cross. The centurion overseeing the execution said, truly, this man was the son of God. How did he figure that out? He simply watched Jesus die as Jesus had lived. He saw that Jesus was who he claimed to be, exhibiting attributes that only the Son of God could possess. And the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus, remember what he said? This man has done nothing wrong. Why would he say that? Because he saw the truth exhibited in Christ even under the stress of horrendous circumstances. Men and women, what's killing the impact of the church today is men and women who are in the church who aren't living the faith. They live two lives. They have their church life, their religious life, and then they have the life that they live in the world. And the world sees that. The world's not stupid. The world sees the inaccuracy and the lack of integrity in our lives. Why would they want that? They got that without Jesus. They don't need Jesus for that. <laughs> So if we're going to change this whole issue of falsehood taking center stage instead of truth, we have to seek the truth, we have to speak the truth, but most of all, we have to live the truth. We have to be who we are all the way through to the core. Amen. And God is allowing that to happen. And, and a lot of churches that I know about now are starting to have some kind of revivals that are bringing that about through prayer, sometimes through fasting.